With so many characters to follow, you have to ask yourself, why isn't the action in the Marvel Cinematic Universe confusing? Like, you know, the action scenes in Transformers. The directors, cinematographers, stunt coordinators, and editors are different for each movie. Yet, we get consistently great action sequences. Why? Is there some sort of formula to all the movies in the Marvel Universe? Maybe there is. Every movie since Iron Man follows the exact same formula in six parts. Part one is what I call the problem. Here, we are presented the key idea of the movie. By the end of this, the movie has been set up. Sometimes you also have a backstory before it, but I group it together because it really forms one big part. This part always has action. The movie has to start with a bang. Two strong examples are Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and The Avengers Age of Ultron. Part 2 is calm and quiet. We meet the characters. With every passing movie, there are more and more characters to deal with. I call this part the assembly. Here the characters learn whatever the movie deals with. In case of an origin story, they learn who they are or what they are capable of, like Doctor Strange or Spider-Man. Part 3 is where the villain makes his first attack, like clockwork, in every single movie. In the Avengers, Loki attacks. In Iron Man 3, Stark's home is attacked. In Thor Ragnarok, Hela arrives. In Doctor Strange, Cassilius attacks. This is usually the first test for our superheroes. And guess what? They actually succeed. Loki is captured, Cassilius is captured, Ultron is defeated, Captain America is arrested, and so on. But that's just a false positive, which is part four. Here we learn the victory was just a smokescreen. Loki had other plans, Ultron is not that easy. In Doctor Strange, the fight takes on a whole new level. In Iron Man 3, Tony finds the Mandarin, but oops, not what he expected. Part 4 also has an action scene, sometimes a great set piece, usually involving the Hulk. Our heroes had better move up to another level if they want to beat the villain. In part 5, they regroup, literally if it's an ensemble piece. I got no plans tomorrow night. I get first crack at the big guy. Iron Man's the one he's waiting for. That's true, he hates you the most. And then we have the climax, the biggest action scene yet. If the false positive had the coolest action scene, the climax is just bigger in scale, in every way. Obviously our heroes emerge victorious, but we also have part 6, the postscript, the aftermath. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is destined to be one continuous story, like Game of Thrones. It's remarkable how every single movie follows this paradigm of six parts, regardless of who the writers or directors are. It's amazing when you think about it. They have produced 20 movies in the last 10 years since Iron Man. And it really is an unprecedented culmination of a series of films interlinked together, which at the time had never been done before. And for us, the important thing is making it all come together. They have to release three movies every year. So you can imagine the magnitude of the planning and commitment it takes to bring out these movies on schedule. The man who probably deserves the greatest credit for this unprecedented success is Kevin Feige, producer and president of Marvel Studios. Now let's talk about the action sequences. It's hard to pull off great action sequences consistently, so there might be a formula to it. Turns out there is. To avoid any spoilers, I'm just going to take a few examples from the first attack part of some movies. The action is definitely borrowed from Hong Kong action movies. The pacing, editing style, camera angles, anybody who knows anything can see that. One of the toughest challenges in a major action scene is to follow the action. Me. This is why I specifically mentioned Transformers in the beginning. The editing and action is chaotic. You have no idea who's fighting or where. After a few seconds of that, you just become numb. But Marvel avoids that. How? First of all, throughout the action, the screen direction or 180 degree rule is maintained. The heroes look one way and the villains look another way. That's simple enough, but there are two twists Marvel applies. One, in between, the directions change for a little while and then return back again to its original position. Sometimes it's done within the shot, sometimes it's a jump cut. A jump cut is used if it's a frenzied action scene. If it's a cool, slow motion kind of action scene, then the transition is often smoother. This removes the boring monotony, especially with long action scenes like the one in Captain America Civil War. 
Second, in most movies, the hero is on the right and the villain is on the left. Not always, but regularly. In the Avengers, when Thor and Iron Man fight, they consistently follow screen direction and never break it. The fight's not big, so there's no need. However, once Captain America intervenes, the scene ends with a surprising shot where the positions are reversed. It's not an accident, they went through the trouble of getting the previous shots to match. It shows the consistency with which the formula is applied. Thor starts out stronger, but ends up losing the battle. Interesting, isn't it? Maintaining character position is one thing, but what about the location? This is where I think Marvel really excels. Here's something really cool. In every single fight or action scene, the location is always an arena. Let me explain. In the previous example, they fight in a forest, but what do you really see? Just random trees and mountains. It's actually an arena. Look at every single action scene in any movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and you'll see for each location, no matter how small or big, it's always like an arena. They fight in the same spot until it's time to move to another location. Check out this sequence from Captain America Civil War. They start out in the room and both Barnes and Captain America stand in place. Then Barnes exits to the landing. He stands in the same spot and fights. They move down the stairs but it always seems like the same place. There are no new distracting elements in the background. We know they're going down but we're not confused because nothing changes. Instead of trees we have stairs. Then they move on to the rooftop, another arena, and finally they land on the highway. Now check this out. They have a huge car chase, but from beginning to end, they are on the same highway. No changes in the background to disorient the audience. Only at the end do we see some variation. The backgrounds are always rich with detail. This is how Marvel stays one step ahead of television. There's depth in the frame, and they don't compromise on the visual effects. Even tiny details are not missed, like the ship falling a few shots later, even though nobody would have missed it. In between the action, we always move to the top angle shot. This gives us a small breather, and at the same time allows us to reorient ourselves in case we got confused. Almost every action scene has a top angle shot. For slow action scenes, the average shot length can be up to 2.5 seconds while for the fast-paced action scenes, the ASL is one second or lesser. To help you follow the action at a breakneck pace, there are both long and short shots. You have close-ups of an interesting weapon or tool, and then a wide shot of it being used. It's not just random editing, and that's why we can follow along. And finally, there's always highlights in the action sequence. I call them Follow the Fallen Shots, where the camera follows the person hit, like in these shots. Boom! Boom! Go Woody Harrelson. Ba, 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 boom, boom, boom. Let's talk about the cinematography and visual look of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. To the unrefined eye, Marvel movies look like any other. Some have criticized it for not being as edgy as the DC Universe. DC has picked dark and green. Marvel is blue and warm. The question is, should each Marvel movie look different? Of course not. If you study toothpaste commercials over the decades, you'll see how little they have changed or how little they vary between cultures. It's more important to focus on the content, great actors, and dialogue. It's capable of busting the bunker under the bunker you just busted. If it were any smarter, it'd write a book. A book that would make Ulysses look like it was written in crayon. And it would read it to you. And mind-blowing action, rather than trying to make each movie look different. Seriously, do you want Captain America's blue or Iron Man's red or the Hulk's green to look different in each movie? So what defines the cinematography of the MCU? First of all, they started with film cameras, but moved on to the Aria Alexa as the primary camera. In Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, they used an 8K RED camera, but has not repeated that for Infinity War or subsequent movies. They have, however, moved up to the Alexa 65. Most of the movies use Panavision Primo lenses. Some of them used anamorphic, but also Panavision lenses. With the Alexa 65, Marvel gets the best of all worlds. A large sensor with the anamorphic look, but with spherical glass in 6.5K resolution. Why do you need spherical lenses? It's easier for the visual effects. A couple of exceptions aside, all Marvel movies are finished in a 2K DCI, so a 6.5K camera is more than enough. Even the trailers are just high definition 1080p. With the Avengers Infinity War, they continue this trend. Airy Alexa 65 and Panavision 70mm lenses. Obviously, this plays a huge role in the look of each movie. 
Even in the framing right from Iron Man all the way through, their center framing. It's so common it has to be a visual signature or formula. I'm pretty sure Marvel has a guidebook somewhere with all these commandments. Big brands have them, so why not Marvel? Every movie is carefully storyboarded and animated. We call them animatics. These are watched with temp sound and music by several people, and maybe even small audiences. Genius is hard work. You have to applaud Marvel for this level of dedication. If they screw up, not only will they lose tons of money, but careers will end and sadly millions of fans will be disappointed. They use multiple cameras on every shoot, at least two or three. One of the lenses is always a telephoto lens. This technique was pioneered by Akira Kurosawa. They're not trying to save money here. A typical Marvel movie has a schedule of about three to four months, if IMDb is to be believed. The biggest ten poles like the Avengers get about six months of shooting time. What Marvel gets is extra footage that helps them in editing and visual effects. Like this scene in Doctor Strange, where one kick is shot from several angles. They could have just used one angle in the final film if one was good enough. In this case, the editors decided it wasn't. Lighting is one aspect where movies are allowed to be slightly different, but even so, they follow standard exposure systems. There are no extremes. For example, silhouettes are very rare in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. When lighting for large action-driven visual effect scenes with many characters, the lighting is almost always a three-quarter lighting style, and is usually lit from above. It takes an army to light all this, but there's a reason you light from above. One, it's soft, so there's consistency throughout the scene. You don't want lighting changes. Second, when you light from above, the exposure remains constant throughout the foreground and background, so no corrections need to be made later. When you light at an angle, the light falls off quickly due to the inverse square law. If you don't understand these terms, I'll put some links in the description. Chroma keys don't always have to be evenly lit. Well, actually they have to be, but are rarely evenly lit. If it's hard to pull, somebody will painstakingly roto it out. They use both green and blue screens. Modern cameras have more green photo sites, so green is the better color overall. Also, most superheroes have some form of blue, so it would be hard to keep. On the other hand, Black Panther has mostly blue chroma keys. Why? I'm guessing two reasons. One, blue is a better color for low light scenes, and second, which I think is more important, blue reflects better on dark skin tones, which is why they decided to use blue throughout. Or at least that's how it looks from behind the scenes videos. The only thing I wish Marvel had done better is for a female superhero story. Maybe Captain Marvel will change that. But it's a shame it took them so long. So what about Avengers Infinity War? I'm gonna call it. Some superheroes might die. You know, the ones that won't get their own movies. Just like in television. But who cares? If the comics are any indication, superheroes can die and be reborn every few years. It doesn't matter how, as long as the action keeps on going. If you enjoyed this video and want more, please subscribe now. This does put a smile on my face. After you subscribe, don't forget to hit the bell you'll see on the right so that you won't miss any new videos.